operation, despite the temperature checks, despite the cleaning, despite the, the auger rotation, we've still ended up with a bit of segregation. segregation. Yep, yeah, it's most unfortunate, but anyway, we noticed that this this morning, we've actually spoken to the contractor and we need to come back out here and just work out two things, you know, how, how segregated it is, so we'll take some cores out, but also, we just need to understand why it happened to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, this is quality control, and it's as we said, we've gone through all the steps, we've taken all the measures, it still happens. It can happen, and unfortunately, but that's the role of surveillance. I mean, we've actually got to make sure we can manage all those things, and if we do have a problem, we address it. How do we correct it? In, some, in the worst case situation, we may need to remove this part of the material. Now, we call this the, the bony section, or rough section, and you're not happy. Why isn't acceptable? Why isn't it? Why can't we have it like that? Well, I have to say, in the areas that are segregated like this, we always have a doubt whether we've achieved the desired compaction. And if we've got too high a voids in the asphalt, it allows the water to penetrate and it actually compromises the life of the asphalt. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed. Segregation is one of the big issues with asphalt. It can be caused by variations in temperature, or the way the asphalt is laid into the truck, or even how placed in the paver. The reason segregation is such an issue, it affects the structural capacity and durability of the asphalt. When we are designing a pavement, we assume that the asphalt is uniform and homogeneous. If this is not correct, then we will not get the expected performance from the asphalt layer. RMS has the right under the Q specification to reject a visually non-homogeneous layer. And that's because in asphalt work, rework is not an option. So removal and replacement can be the only solution. That's right. Segregation is a problem better avoided by carefully controlling the asphalt production, transport and laying processes. So let's break them down firstly into the manufacture process. In the manufacturing process, some of the causes of segregation are the use of larger sized stone mixes, the segregation within aggregate stockpiles, which is usually due to the way the stockpile is created, incorrect operation of the hot storage bins, where it's better to discharge into the bin in large drops rather than a dribble. And Asheville storage bins should be kept to a minimum one half to two thirds full. Because as things fall over distance, they naturally start to segregate into sizes. That's right. And we need to be on the watch for it to minimise or better still, avoid it altogether. Okay, so that's segregation in relation to manufacture. But what about segregation as it pertains to transport? Segregation can occur with loading of the trucks. Here we have to ensure that we load in the minimum number of drops and not trickle feed the asphalt to make up the target weight. So we're back on the highway on the central coast. Now Kev, it looks like the asphalt is about to hit the road. That's it, yeah. Well, the trucks have just brought in the asphalt. We're now setting up the paver and eventually we're setting up the shuttle buggy, getting ready for the delivery of the asphalt to the paver. Now this is really where the work is done. Well, this is a transfer vehicle or a shuttle buggy. And what you'll find in the beginning of that is the uh, receiving hopper. The trucks will tip into there. We actually then is conveyed up. We have a mixing chamber and it gives us a chance to actually remix the asphalt so we've got an even temperature. And then we'll feed that material then into the hopper in the front of the paver. Final checks, Kev. What are the final things you're looking out for? Well, there's a few things we need to check. First up, we've got to make sure the asphalt temperature is right. So we'll have people actually checking the delivery temperatures and the temperature of the asphalt as it goes into the shuttle buggy. He's now taking the temperature of the mix and now he's another important cog in this machine. He's actually measuring the temperature as it's been delivered out of the truck. So it's imperative that we get the temperatures right. They actually come to the site probably between 140 to 160, just depending on the asphalt. But it is a dangerous position. We actually have people that are trained to actually do the job safely. Is there a difference between the, the surface temperature and, and the core temperature, and does that matter? Well, there is actually a difference. With an infrared thermometer, it actually just measures the outer temperature of a stone or a particle. What we need to do is make sure that when we take a temperature with the infrared, that it's actually the asphalt is moving. So inside the truck itself, it will be a different temperature. It'll be as basically as it was produced. On the outside, it actually can cool and chill. 
And so what we are doing is making sure that we get the right temperature range by just making sure that we take measurements as the asphalt is flowing. I never realised that temperature was such an important thing to consider. Obviously when it leaves the factory it's in a perfect state, but the variables kick in in the trucks. That temperature can vary, you've got to keep a handle on it. That's right. Well, we use devices like the shuttle buggy to help us manage the temperature issues. Now, the, sh the shuttle buggy, Kev, it's an important piece of equipment because it allows us to stand off the, the tacked up surface, but it does more than that, doesn't it? Well, it does. It actually makes a discontinuity between the truck and the paver. It actually has the ability to remix the material. It cannot reheat the material, but it actually makes sure that if we have cold spots on the truck delivery or the asphalt as delivered by the trucks, that the shuttle buggy will mix it all up and then it'll make sure that by the time it goes into the hopper on the paver, it's at a uniform temperature. On this particular job, the street is actually quite narrow. So we've been fortunate to be laying about three, 3.2 metres wide. Yep. But in, an, in another job where it's actually, uh, the streets are extended, we run the risk of having segregation on the outside of the board. So you've got to be very careful to make sure that we actually have a good constant head of material in front of the screed and we actually have the augers turning but not turning too quick that they fling the material and segregate it to the side of the board. So all in all this is a pretty well prepared stretcher road, not too wide, in fact that's a, about a lane width isn't it? It is a lane width in this particular job and we've been fortunate that with the traffic and being able to manage the traffic in such a way that we can actually lay the asphalt in one lane. In other jobs, we actually have to do one and a half lanes, and as those boards are extended out, it really becomes critical that we make sure that we don't get too much segregation of the asphalt at the extremities, and on, in an ideal world, we'd actually have it augers that also extend out. OK, the ash field's down, now we've got the, the roller in there, he's going sideways. Well, what he's actually doing is making sure we get a good transition from the ash field that was laid yesterday to today's work. So you'll see actually that he's just rolling it smooth and rolling flat. That's why it was essential to take off any of the loose material yeah. on the old ash field. So that's the joint between yesterday's work and today's work? That's correct. Now as a supervisor overseer, you need to check that level where the joint is. Well, you've got to make sure you've got a good straight joint. So you'll see actually that uh, they've got a straight edge out there. They're just checking it. And while the asphalt is hot, it gives you the chance to actually make any adjustments if you have to. Now, Kevin, we've avoided segregation in terms of mix and temperature. We've laid our mat. We've addressed our joint. What now? Well, what we see here happening here is we've got uh, a couple of screed hands at the back here. They're just making sure we've got sufficient material up against the face of the kerb. And on the other side, he'll butt back and push back any excess material that might fall over. So what we're looking to try and do is make sure that we haven't got any gaps in the, in the fresh asphalt mat. Now this fella hasn't left his lunchbox on the road, that's an important piece of equipment. It is, actually what you're seeing there is a nuclear densometer. What he's doing is measuring the density of the asphalt as we've just laid it. And if there's a problem with it, whilst it's still hot, the roller can come back and give it a couple of more passes and just make sure we get the right compaction. So he's in contact with the driver of the roller, you need another pass, no it's okay, move on. Exactly right, he will give feedback to the roller operator that the rolling pattern that they established at the beginning is still OK. If he needs to make any adjustments, then they just do it while the asphalt's still hot. And while we're here, Kev, the ultimate goal here is to create a nice, beautiful, comfortable ride for the motorist, but not at the expense of safety and the geometry of the road. Well, that's right. On this particular job, you know, we should be able to achieve the geometry in the ride, but there are situations, especially in high-speed roads, we've got to make sure that we don't only achieve and chase ride results and at the expense of the geometry. Because these, sorry, these machines are set up to take out all the bumps 
and in so doing they may in fact override the, the design of the, the, the geometry. Well wherever we're going through curves, transitions and things like that in the road geometry we've got to make sure that the referencing points that are used for the machines are appropriate. So we actually have the ability to shorten those down but again it's all about getting the geometry right and making sure we don't compromise the safety. Well, we've had the preparation and we've had the layering of this first coat of ash, Phil. How does it look to an expert? Well, I'm actually reasonably happy with it. Actually, you'll see it's very uniform in appearance. We don't have any apparent segregation, and that's really what we're trying to achieve. I would have said the same thing, Ken. Yeah. Okay, Kevin, summing up, what are the key points to remember when it comes to ash felt surveillance? The first thing is that all relevant specification requirements must be met. And that means working to the specifications in these R116, R119 and R121. Correct. Next is ensuring all the necessary controls are in place throughout the production and laying processes. Good performance of asphalt is dependent on having a uniform, properly compacted product on the pavement. This is achieved by ensuring that we are using the right asphalt produced to the approved mix design that the product is transported, paved and compacted correctly. As we've seen, asphalt surveillance entails the verification of compliance by the asphalt contractor in the following areas. Mix design, asphalt production and asphalt laying. Sometimes it's easy to forget one of these. However, to produce an asphalt pavement with minimal whole of life cost, all three areas must meet specification requirements. There's a lot to it to get it right, isn't there? Remember though, above all, work health and safety guidelines must be adhered to to ensure everyone is safe on the job site. It is important that surveillance only be carried out by trained surveillance officers with field experience. For more information on asphalt specification compliance, Pavement Branch can be contacted and relevant training is also available.